Hello, uh, my name is Karol Gugar, um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, open source accelerators and VM accelerators. That's a pretty long title, but I think it summarizes, you know, all the pieces and the bits and pieces that, that uh, are combined together to, to build uh, the system that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so, first a few words, uh, who am I, uh, where I came from? I'm from AdMicro, uh, we've been here for quite some time. Uh, Basically, we're doing uh, we're doing services. We build uh, devices uh, from open source components. And this presentation is actually a pretty nice example of what you can do by just combining a bunch of open source uh, open source pieces, uh, uh, combining them together, and and you know uh, integrating into a bigger, uh, better system. So, um, what is it all about? I mean, this the whole long title. What is it all about? Uh, the whole story is that together with Western Digital, um, uh, we worked on building a platform for research on computational storage. What is computational storage and why do we need it? I will tell, you, uh, I will tell about it in the next slide. But first, uh, a few uh, a few assumptions that, that you know we uh, took when we started when we started building the, the whole system. So basically, uh, we wanted to create a platform where researchers can work, uh, on which researchers can work uh, on, on development of those computational storage uh, devices, accelerators, and technologies that, that can be used there. Uh, so first assumption was that it has to be open source. Uh, it has to be available for researchers. Uh, it has to be flexible. So we used uh, designing FPGA SOC. So we, can, we have like a freedom of like adding new logic and, and re-implementing uh, re software and adding new stuff and develop it in a way that it's easily extensible uh, with some new comments, with some new uh, ideas that have you like to test. Um, so why do we actually need uh, accelerators in NVMe drives, those computational uh, storages? Uh, this is because, you know, we're developing into a world where everything is processed with machine learning, with AI and stuff. So uh, typically those applications, they consume a lot of data. And this data is stored somewhere, mostly in data centers. Uh, so getting them back from data center into uh, some like a bulky machine or spawning new machine uh, somewhere in the cloud and getting the data there, uh, basically, causes a lot of traffic uh, on those uh, in data centers, and we don't really want that. Uh, so having possibility of like uh, processing the data near to the storage is actually pretty fine. And also it can address things like you can process the data on the fly. So imagine a situation where you want to store like video uh, and the video contains like sensitive data, like faces, you know, maybe plates or something like that. Uh, so if you want to store it, you have to comply with a bunch of regulations. But if you anonymize it on the fly, you don't because you don't really store sensitive data, uh, which is which is pretty nice. So uh, having accelerators somewhere there in the data center, somewhere there near the storage is pretty fine. But to have it, you need to have a hardware. And uh, Western Digital actually built pretty nice hardware uh, that, that uh, can be used there. It's a, a two and a half inch form factor. So looks like a disk drive, but it's not a disk drive. Uh, it's a, basically a development platform with uh, this uh, ultra scale MPSOG, this thingy here. Um, so, uh, uh, and a bunch of RAM and then so on. So with, with the, all the connections and all that stuff. So this is there, we can, we can work, work with it. Uh, but to make the whole system available for wider audience, we also make it, uh, usable on uh, off the shelf platform this one is not as fancy as uh, as the one from western digital it's a, a, a quite bulky it's like that big uh, development platform but you can buy it um that's that's the plus size uh, plus side of, of that one uh so yeah let's take a look at uh, how the system works the most interesting part of the system is within the chip within the uh, zinc mpsoc um so uh, you can divide it into two pieces. Uh, there is a programmable logic, FPGA, and there is a processing system which is composed of uh, CPUs, interconnects, and a bunch, uh, bunch of peripherals. So let's first focus on, on this side. Um, we added, um, there is, I clicked something. Escape? Oh no. Maybe this? Okay, and now full screen. 
Ah, okay. So how can I remove this T thingy? Because I will click something again. Okay, let's you know, maybe try to not click it. So we have this PCI core uh, that connects uh, this device to a host system, uh, then some logic uh, around it uh, to, to uh, implement NVMe stuff, and that one connects to a, to a CPU part. This way, host system can actually uh, send NVMe uh, comments to the device and we can handle those. And those comments, like typical NVMe, like standard NVMe comments are, uh, there are two groups of those, like those admin comments uh, required for like uh, discovering the drives, setting what's, what's there, or like handling, uh, uh, managing the, the uh, instructions. And there's of course IO comments for uh, um, uh, reading, like moving the date. Uh, so on the other side, when we have those, uh, this logic that, that runs there, we have a, a CPU part. And if you, if you look here, uh, there are like two CPUs. There is Cortex i53, that one runs Linux. There is Cortex R5, I will talk about it in a moment. And if you look at the connections, Cortex R5, only Cortex R5 is connected to the uh, NVMe logic within the FPGA itself. So, uh, uh, we run Zephyr on Cortex R5. Um, uh, we use that one because Zephyr implements a bunch of. Uh, uh, it's, it was there. I mean, the port was was there, so that's that was one thing. But it implements a bunch of functionalities that were really useful and makes it made it uh, made it really. I mean, makes it, made it way easier to implement the whole system. Um, so we use. Cortex, uh, we use the Zephyr application running on the Cortex F5 to handle all the base and VME comments. So every time uh, the host uh, wants something from the drive, uh, we handle it in, in Zephyr and Cortex F5. So basically, you know, it works in a way the host creates, builds like a command queue in its own memory, then it writes some registers in this programmable logic uh, within the FPGA that may, uh, some of them generates interrupts. So we just handle that, we fetch the data process it in and so on. And every unknown comment that, that you know, no, no, a comment that is not from a standard set, uh, we pass it to Linux system running on uh, Cortex A53. And I will talk about how this is done and how we handle that in a, in a few slides. First, let's uh, see how we, uh, let's take a few slides on FPGA part. So one of the problems with uh, building a system uh, where you have a PGA uh, and you put piece of the system in FPGA is that FPGA is reconfigurable. And reconfigurable in a way that you change the logic there and you can change like a uh, register layout, you can change memory map, you can change all those things. And there is not really, you know, convenient, there are no convenient mechanisms uh, in operating systems to handle that unless you implement some kind of a discovery mechanism, which will then consume like some of the resources. So we didn't want that. Uh, so uh, how can we actually handle that? And in our project, we decide to generate this code on the fly. It's not a new idea. I mean, it's done uh, you know, in, a, uh, in many projects uh, to just generate like dynamic code on the fly, but we made it uh, you know, one step further. Uh, so besides generating C and header codes, we, we also generate FPGA code. And, there is actually one source of truth for NVMe. It's NVMe specification. The problem with that is that NVMe uh, organization distributes that as a PDF. So we implemented uh, like a, a set of scripts that just read this, pass this PDF, gets all the tables that are required, just gets the, uh, the, the data from it and builds the whole stuff. So the stuff is like header file C code for low level accessors. That's Pretty easy. That's pretty obvious. I mean, a lot of pro projects do that. Uh, but we also generate uh, FPGA code, this Chiso code. If you're not familiar with that, Chiso is a Scala-based hardware description language. So we can uh, develop digital logic, low, low level, very very low level, uh, but with all the features that modern uh, programming languages give you. So all the yeah. Um, just a question. So, Chisel is that um, was that LaTeX that's uh, done in Chisel, or I can't remember. No, no, no. it's uh, uh, it's uh, LaTeX is uh, a framework for booting SOCs. Libraries. That one uses MyGen, uh, okay. which is Python based, uh, something similar, but in Python. Okay. Uh, Chisel is in Scala, uh, so, that, so that's slightly different. Um, the whole generator code is, is available on GitHub, so so we can take a look at that. Uh, and if you feel it, uh, if you feel just just fork it and and. 
uh, adjust for your needs. Uh, so this uh, chisel code for the registers look more or less like that. So this is an object. Uh, this is an object. Basically, that's a dictionary. Uh, you can you can read it as uh, actually this dictionary mapping uh, integer something to a module uh, implementing the logic. So later when we uh, generate Verilog code from it, the, the code that we are actually synthesizing and, and um, placing routing into the FPGA, we can quite easily generate a logic for uh, accessing the registers and the whole uh, uh, the, the whole accessor, you know, like like multiplexing logic for for that. Uh, so it's, it, look, it looks readable, and also we generate a bunch of definitions for the registers. Um, that, that defines like a bit field, so it's the code in the end is readable. Yeah, the code in the end is you can just access, uh, simply access a, a, a field that, that you're interested in. So getting back to uh, to the software, as I said, we have this uh, flow where you know uh, host sends us like like gives us uh, information that there is a new instruction, new comment and Vimy comment. We pass it. If it's standard and Vimy comment, we just handle it in, in Zephyr application. We don't bother with the rest of the system. But what if there is a there is a comment that we don't know? We we just move it, we just uh, take it to, to, to Linux. Uh, and this way you can actually implement whatever you want uh, in Linux to, to handle that. Uh, in our case uh, we used uh, for cross communication between those CPUs, uh, we use remote proc uh, for like sending messages back and forth, and we use OpenAMP implementation. Uh, that was pretty obvious choice because both Zephyr and Linux implement that, so you know it was there. Uh, we even did uh, we even did support for for Zephyr part on this Cortex R in this particular chip, so you know uh, there was uh, everything was there. We just could we just could take it and and uh, combine it together. Uh, so in our implementation, in this first implementation of this like platform of this framework, uh, we use uh, we run a service in Linux, and this service basically handles all the intercommunication between those CPUs, and it also uh, runs a BPF virtual machine that can run any payload that you provide. Uh, so uh, this BPF virtual machine is to show how you can implement an accelerator. Uh, so basically, standard NVMe is there, you can just send the data, but then you can send, uh, use custom NVMe comments to provide the whole system with a, a BPF bytecode, and this BPF bytecode can, can refer to like certain memory blocks somewhere on the NVMe drive. So basically you can just load it with data with like simple DD, then use NVMe CLI to provide the, the, the BPF uh, bytecode. BPF bytecode can be, of course, generated with, uh, with LVM, so that's, that's pretty, pretty easy. Uh, and since um, we wanted to, uh, to make it extendable, we wanted to have uh, something that can uh, run machine learning and AI payloads. Uh, so to do that from a BPF code, first of all, we, need to, uh, we had to run uh, BPF virtual machine, and we used micro BPF, which is an uh, implementation of user land BPF virtual machine, so you don't have to run it in, in kernel, in the kernel, you can run it there. Uh, and that made, made it pretty, pretty easy to, you know, uh, extend the whole system with additional instructions to just provide the system with, uh, 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 with, uh, uh, with, with some payloads that to, to be run. Uh, but how to actually uh, get some acceleration, some like uh, runtimes, machine learning or AI runtimes uh, accessible from BPF code. BPF is a virtual machine and, and you would like to at some point probably talk to the hardware. Uh, so how to do that? Uh, so we choose, uh, we choose a, a TensorFlow Lite uh, as a runtime, as a machine learning framework runtime, uh, which is pretty cool because TensorFlow Lite, you can compile it into a library and just load. Uh, so it's not like a hardware dependent uh, per se. Uh, of course, you can make it hardware dependent, but, but uh, it's not like that uh, per se. Uh, it provides already uh, implementation for most of the uh, for most of the operations that you typically have in machine learning models. So you can quite easily run almost any model on a CPU. Uh, but it also provides you 
uh, infrastructure for implementing something which is called um, delegates. So you can quite easily extend uh, extend the, the library with some custom code that would allow you to run any payload on any any hardware accelerator. I will show how it's done later. But how to actually access uh, external code from a virtual machine from BPF code. So uh, there is an option you can extend, I hope that's visible, uh, you can extend a virtual machine and micro BPF itself uh, and register new calls for the functions that are external to the, to the machine itself. So basically, as you can see here, there are like uh, two functions. The third is not defined, but you know, uh, you probably know what, what, how it can be done. And then you just register it within the machine with some kind of a number, and it's there. And then from a BPF code, uh, this is of course C code, but cross -compi compiled with LLVM to then BPF bytecode, you, uh, you can use this function by just uh, first defining a pointer with a very dummy value, like one to three. And if you compare it here, they were registered with the same numbers here. Uh, so in the end, bytecode just references to func external function one, and you can use it. It's not very convenient because you have to upfront have a, a virtual machine uh, that knows what's there, what's what's you know uh, what what functions are available uh, to be able to run your bytecode that, that you compile. So uh, we uh, we have already something working. It's not yet published. That, that's why I have this coming soon here. Uh, we have already a mechanism for dynamic loading that. I mean, the virtual machine can just load a library, and then if a symbol is referenced from a bytecode, just check if the symbol is there. If it's there, just, just uh, jump to it. Uh, so this makes it way more convenient for, for the user in the end to, uh, to use external functions and to use some like external accelerators. So with, those, uh, with this runtime in place, with uh, TensorFlow uh, thingy, uh, TensorFlow Lite thingy in place, uh, with delegates in place, we could actually, you know, think of adding an accelerator, right? like a physical uh, hardware accelerator to the system. So for the first implementation, the, the system basically is not, uh, the whole framework is not really uh, constrained, like you have to use this one. You can use whatever accelerator you want, uh, even connect it with a USB, for example, like, like you know, uh, some, some additional external uh, accelerator, but for the first, uh, implementation for the first uh, uh, showcase, we, we chose uh, VTA, which stands for Versatile Tensor Accelerator. That one comes from Apache's uh, TVM uh, project. And this is a uh, open source uh, accelerator that you can deploy in FPGA. Of course, you can make ASIC from it, but FPGA is way, way faster and way cheaper uh, to, to play with. Um, and it's implemented in Chizo. Basically, it's a, like a coprocessor where uh, which you can program, which you can feed with, like a, uh, uh, again, I would say bytecode uh, that it can process, fetch the data from a memory, process, and write back. Yep. Hey, Carol, just had, had a quick question. So um, I don't know how many slides are left exactly. I just wanted to say there's 10 minutes left, but also, um, so I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, you know, we're talking about NVMe here, but we're also, this is an IoT microconference. So, and maybe I'm leading a bit, but you think it's possible to kind of take the server class uh, 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 AI accelerator that you've designed and kind of scale it down to something? Yeah, of course. You, yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, this this TVM is not that big. I'm, uh, uh, I mean, VTA is not that big. It is configurable, so we can uh, you can shorten like uh, you know pipelines. You can show the memories uh, there, and I'm pretty sure you could fit it into into like a smaller device. Uh, like a smart camera or something yeah, like that, yeah. or using AI for... Yeah, uh, actually, you know, with, with all the... Uh, I'm not sure if you heard of, but, but uh, there is this whole uh, MPW shuttle yeah, program yeah. From, from Google <laughs> where you can basically design your own chip, open source chip, uh, give it to them, and you will get it for free. Uh, of course, you have to wait a few months uh, to, to, to get it, uh, but you can, you can produce your own chip. So, you know, with that one, you can, you can probably put it there, yeah? Do you know how many resources of that um, ultra scale does the uh, VTA consume in percent, um, give or take? I can check it, but I don't have the number right now. Uh, I can check it after the, the presentation. And I have another question regarding the NVMe. Mm -hmm. uh, so when the host PC sends a command to the NVMe, 
in the SingMP and that command gets propagated to the Linux system, that probably takes a while, right? Um, is is there a possibility that the command on the host PC would time out? Uh, it could time out if you do like a lot of stuff before ACK in the, uh, the command. But the only thing you need to do when, when the command is there uh, is to ACK it, basically. Um, and that one is pretty fast. Uh, then, of course, if you like wait for, uh, for the results, you should do something like check if there is a result, and if it is, just get it. Uh, just not try to get it like immediately because it may take some time to process the data uh, at some point. But uh, just a send like a, if you send like a load firmware command, for example, uh, you just have to ICK it. You just, just set a flag like okay, I handle that, and then that, that's all. Yeah. Okay, so uh, with this TVM there, uh, the TVM there is, is a, a, sorry, VTA there is just a first accelerator that, that uh, can be used. And basically, basically this is what, uh, what the delegate, what the software have to do. So uh, you have like a payload with some like a machine learning pipeline, machine learning model. Uh, so the delegate have to translate it uh, into set of comments that are fed into the accelerator, in this case, into VTA. So basically that's a, you know, load some data, process it with that, uh, uh, with that kernel, for example. Uh, kernel, I mean like a piece of, uh, a small piece of software that, that runs on the accelerator, uh, and so on, so on. They write the buffer somewhere else and use the next kernel to process it further, and so on, and so on, so on. So in the end, you have a uh, you have a result that you can uh, write back to some uh, space in the NVMe uh, drive, or just you know uh, send back to, to the host. Uh, so yeah, that, that's how it works. And if you'd like to uh, get on with the project, uh, like grab some some piece of it and then use it. It's all open source. Right now it's on, on Micros GitHub, but it's gonna be donated to Chips Alliance soon. Uh, uh, for now, like today, if you want to grab it, it's there. We, we just follow this link. Uh, there is more uh, directories than just, uh, there are more repositories than just this link. Uh, the, the main one collects all of the pieces to build the, the entire system. So basically you can just clone it, grab all the uh, sub-modules. There's even a Docker file and like make Docker uh, targets to, to build you like a development environment if you don't want to play with, with all that stuff. You have to have um, uh, FPGA tools though, those are not provided uh, in the Docker and those are unfortunately proprietary, so we cannot use them. We cannot provide them like uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the repository, but fortunately they are free, so we can just, you know, exchange your, uh, email address and some like private data uh, to, to get the tools. Uh, so if you're interested, just go there, grab stuff, and, and uh, uh, please, uh, you, you can play with it. Uh, just to wrap it up, uh, uh, the system there kind of presents, yeah, it kind of builds like a pretty, pretty nice research platform. It's all open source. It's all, you know, you, you can use it on off the shelf development platform. Uh, so I hope, you know, researchers will just uh, start using that. Uh, you can use it to develop like a bigger, smaller uh, accelerators and just use them without worrying of like how to interface it with the rest of the system. It's there. Uh, contributions are welcome. And if you want to just grab like a piece of the code, not the whole system, feel free. Most of the code is licensed uh, on Apache 2.0. Of course, the pieces like Linux, U-Boot, and things like that are licensed with GPL and whatever license that they had. Uh, originally, but, but the rest uh, is permissively licensed, so feel free to grab it, use it, and then combine it with whatever you want. Thank you, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to so, answer. Thanks a lot, Carol, for that. That was really impressive to see. I think we have like one question here, and then I have one from the internet. Mm -hmm. so we can... uh, well, I was curious. I had heard Western Digital is very much into Risk Five, mm -hmm. and so I was surprised to see the the ARM cortexes, and I wonder if that's a transition that you think it, that's relevant to you or um, not? Yeah, I mean, we, we're also uh, deeply involved in, in Risk Five uh, with on, on Micro. Um, so this, the whole system can could be easily implemented on Risk Five. There's nothing really uh, like ARM related. Yeah. Yes, yes. The the the, the SOC we use, the SOC we use. Uh, had already uh, those uh, ARM CPUs, but there is pretty uh, nice support in Zephyr 
for RISC V uh, microcontrollers. Uh, there is really good support in Linux for uh, for RISC V, so you know combining them two together shouldn't be that hard. You just need a uh, you just need a platform that that could do that. Uh, there is a microchip uh, FPGA that could potentially do that. I mean, there is this uh, 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 Polar Fire SOC, uh, like Risk Five SOC with FPGA. Uh, it doesn't have like microcontroller part like easily accessible, but still the system could be ported to into that one. Okay, thanks. So there's another question on the chat. So let me, let me read it out. Uh, when do you know when the data processing has finished and you can get it back on the host system? NVE interrupt polling. Uh, so NVMe, uh, you have to pull it from uh, from the host site. Basically, just read register if it's ready. Uh, so, so yeah. Thank you. So any more questions in the room here? I was wondering um, with CXL, um, would this also apply to? Devices not like computational storage with CXL, and if so, is there like open IP for for that instead of NVMe? Uh, open IP for NVMe control itself. Well, like I mean, I don't know too much about it, but one of the new protocols for attaching things is CXL. So I was wondering if that's relevant at all to the computational storage, or is that um, different thing? It's not. Tested here. I'm not sure. To be honest, I would have to uh, read a, a bit more about if, if there is something. Uh, but probably, if, if, if there is, it should be pretty easy to implement here to extend uh, the stuff here. I think the main advantage there would be that uh, there's you don't need as much uh, in terms of DMAing stuff around because CXL is the direct uh, memory access. So then you're just really relying on interrupts. It's kind of nice. Hmm? Uh, are we at time? Just one more minute. One minute. Uh, any other questions? Okay, well, uh, Carol, that's for pretty fantastic. He did this talk at ZDS too, and I thought it was super impressive. So thanks again for coming out. Thank you. And this is like fantastic. So round of applause, please. Thanks.